Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Game of Thrones final season has an official trailer! Battles, dragons, uncomfortable realizations of incest. Damn, I have missed talking about this show! And now we finally have footage that's longer than 3 or 5 seconds to break down. 1 minute 53 seconds? Yeah, 24 frames per second, that's like 27 billion frames to break down. Hey, I'm not good at math. There are missable details all over these shots, all pointing to clues for how this epic Game of Thrones story could end, so let us Dig through it all, frame by frame, and spoiler warning in case any of this speculation ends up being too accurate and ruins your life. Okay, let's get started. I know death. He's got many faces. Okay, we open on Arya Stark, scared, alone in the darkness, her face covered in sweat and blood from a nasty wound on her forehead. She appears to be running from someone or from something, and she looks way more scared than we've seen her in recent seasons, at least now that she's become a master assassin. But who or what is she running from? Much of this trailer's footage appears to come from the epic Battle of Winterfell that's supposed to happen in episode three of this final season. And here, Arya could be fleeing a White Walker or a white, a resurrected corpse, after they have breached the walls of Winterfell. Now, Arya could be setting the trap, you know, pretending to flee, but really luring this pursuer to a place that she can more easily kill them, just like she did with that pesky waif in Braavos in season six. But I don't know, that fear looks pretty sincere. She doesn't look like she's performing. So in case it's not a trap, let's consider other options. Notice how she's clutching that dragon glass dagger that she equips herself in the later clip? And she still has the Valyrian steel cat's paw dagger on her side. So she is armed with two ways to kill a White Walker. So maybe she just chokes when she finally sees one in the flesh or in the dead flesh. Or maybe this particular white is a corpse that freaked her out for another big reason. Like it's the corpse of a dead family member. Super fans and readers of the books know that the show seems to have moved on from introducing the character Lady Stoneheart from the books as a character on the show. But maybe Catelyn Stark's resurrected corpse could be the thing Thing, Arya is so afraid to attack here. Or for that matter, a headless Ned Stark skeleton. A headless Rob Stark corpse. The corpses of Rickon or Aunt Lyanna. There's a lot of spooky old Starks that are buried there. Still, I think this is a look of fear only a mother could inspire. Like, oh god, I left the porn tab open on the family computer. Another theory is that Arya could be running from the faceless men who might have hunted her down to Winterfell. Which could be why we hear Arya talking about her time worshipping the many-faced god in this clip. I guess that's also the look of fear only a runaway cult member could have. Like, can we let go of the blood out policy, fellas? I have another theory for where Arya could be and who she's running from, and I'll get to it later. But also in this clip, we see Sir Davos Seaworth walking the battlements of the Winterfell Castle as the archers prepare. This all reminds me a lot of the moments leading up to the Battle of Helm's Deep in The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, and that is by design. This episode is being directed by the great Miguel Sapochnik, who directed the Battle of the Bastards in the Hard Home episode. He's really the best. And he set out to make a battle sequence like what Helm's Deep was to the Lord of the Rings. A nasty nighttime brawl. But he wanted to make his even longer and more complex. In interviews, cast and crew said that they built out the whole outdoor Winterfell set so that Sapochnik could shoot all of this action practically without using too much green screen or visual effects. It was a grueling production that lasted 11 weeks of night shoots, which the crew nicknamed The Long Night after the fictional winter in the Game of Thrones backstory that spans several generations. And looks like it might be happening again. In this clip, we also see Varys huddled with the women and children in the Winterfell crypts. Behind him, I think you can see Gilly with her son, young Sam, and that might be Sansa behind them as well. Now, this is interesting for a few reasons. One, remember, Jon suggested in the past that he would send everyone to fight the army of the dead, including women, children, and yeah, probably eunuchs. Instead, these more vulnerable people are waiting out the battle, similar to when Sansa and Cersei stowed themselves in Maegor's holdfast during the Battle of Blackwater. It's also something that we saw the women and children do in the Battle of Helm's Deep. I'm curious to know what kind of stories or jokes or motivational speeches Varys will tell these others to keep their minds off the battle upstairs. But we should also remind ourselves that Gilly's baby was fathered by Craster and was therefore promised to the White Walkers, presumably to be converted to a young new member of their White Walker race. Remember, the White Walkers came after Sam and Gilly for this baby before, and if they breach these crypts, or if the dead Stark ancestors rise out of their tombs as whites, this baby is going to become a 
real hot potato. Before I move on, Arya's voiceover is interesting. She brags that she knows death, saying he's got many faces, suggesting that this Night King is just one of many faces of the many-faced god, aka death, whom she worshipped as part of the faceless men. And now she seeks to fight the god whom she once worshipped. In the Entertainment Weekly article that preceded this trailer release, one of the accompanying photos included this shot of the Night King. Look closely at those eyes. The pupils are in the shape of seven pointed stars. Of course, the symbol of the faith of the seven, the new gods. So the fact that this is on the Night King, someone who's been more associated with the old gods of the north, this could be another clue that all of the religions of Westeros and Essos, these new gods, the old gods of the north, the Lord of Light of Essos, the many-faced god, the drowned god from the Iron Islands, are all different interpretations of these same natural phenomena and myths. Kind of like how our real world religions have their own takes on devastating floods and game-changing messiahs. Or, you know, maybe this Entertainment Weekly was just a photoshopped promo image and the Night's King eyes don't normally look like that, which is entirely plausible. Let's move on. I look forward to seeing this one. Everything you did brought you where you are now. Okay, once again, Arya runs for her life, and we hear this sound. It sounds like the snarl of the White Walker, and like that one who attacks Sam and Gilly. But look closely at the shot of Arya. There is definitely a shadow of someone chasing after her. It's hard to tell, though it does look lower than her, like maybe someone shorter than her, or someone coming upstairs, or maybe it's just the angle of the light casting a lower shadow on the wall. But then we move on to a braver Arya before she wets herself in that whole scramble, arming herself with this dragonglass dagger. In addition to her changed demeanor, she's also wearing this cape in the shot, which she no longer has when she was running. This also ties into my other theory for whom Arya could be running from. I'll get to that later. But next, we see the Iron Fleet of Euron Greyjoy with his black sails and Kraken sigil. At the end of Season 7, Cersei said that she sent Euron to retrieve the Golden Company of Essos and bring them back to Westeros. And that appears to be whom we see in the next shot, on board Euron's flagship, the Silence. This figure with the blonde hair could be Harry Strickland, leader of the Golden Company, perhaps played by Mark Grisman. The Golden Company is an army of swords founded by supporters of House Blackfire of Daemon Blackfire, bastard son of King Aegon IV Targaryen, who legitimized Daemon and kicked off the whole Blackfire Rebellion, which is actually a series of rebellions among sects of the Targaryen family. It all took place 100 years before the main events of Game of Thrones. Anyway, after this failed rebellion, the soldiers fled to the free cities of Essos and founded this elite mercenary company of over 10,000 infantry and war elephants. The thing about them is they never break their contracts. Their motto is, our word is as good as gold. And remember, Cersei took out a loan from the Iron Bank to pay for the Golden Company to help her defeat Daenerys' army, essentially going behind Danny's back after Danny's plea to Cersei to join their cause against the threat from the North. And next, this is exciting, Tormund Giant's Bane and Beric Dondarrion with his flaming sword confirmed to still be alive after the Night King's attack on the wall at Eastwatch by the Sea Thank God. They now join Dolores Ed, currently commander of the Night's Watch, or at least whatever's left of it. I just love that these three are together considering their vastly different backgrounds. A wildling, a rogue religious nut from the Stormlands, and a goth. <laughs> so I'm guessing Tormund and Beric ran down the wall westward to meet Ed at Castle Black. And next we see Bran and Sam, perhaps discussing which one of them will break that awkward news to Jon that he's been sleeping with his aunt. Or maybe this is during the Battle of Winterfell and Sam could be tasked with protecting Bran. Let's move on. Where you belong. Coming. Okay, next is a shot of King's Landing with Cersei smiling as she looks out, flanked by her hand, Kyburn, and commander of the Queen's Guard, Gregor Clegane, the Mountain. Perhaps she's smiling because she sees the Iron Fleet arriving with her golden company. Cersei now wears this new shoulder armor with chains, perhaps to reflect her refusal to surrender in the war for the Iron Throne against Danny's forces. Next, there's a shot of this boy watching the unsullied marching through Wintertown on the way to Winterfell. Wintertown is a small town on the outskirts of the castle walls, contains that brothel that Terry met Roz in, and that place where Brienne stayed in to keep watch on Sansa while listening to Sting and the police on repeat. And for those asking, no, I don't think this boy is the love child of Jon and Danny in the distant future. Keep in mind, this is the Unsullied first arrival at Winterfell. We don't even know if Danny's pregnant. Just, you know, stop 
wanting children from incest to happen, please. During this arrival, we see John and Danny marching with the Unsullied side by side, neither of them leading the other. And this is an important approach because I'm sure John doesn't want these northerners to think he's already given in to this Targaryen invader, but rather, according to optics at least, they're on the same side of the greater conflict. And Sansa marvels at the sight of Daenerys' dragon soaring overhead. There's Drogon and Rhaegal, and for once, the colors are actually vibrant in their wings. The red and black of Drogon, the green and bronze of Rhaegal. I gotta say, the imagery of dragons over Winterfell is striking. It actually reminds me of that passage in A Clash of Kings in which Bran envisioned, through the eyes of his direwolf, Summer, a great winged snake that breathed fire flying over the ashes of Winterfell as it burned down. And that led to a popular fan theory that there could be a dragon egg buried in the crypts beneath Winterfell. The idea being that all Targaryen babies are given a dragon egg as a gift, and John, aka Aegon, could have an egg, egg's egg, and that it could have been buried by Ned alongside the remains of Lyanna Stark in order to hide the truth about her marriage to Rhaegar and the truth about John's true lineage. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I do like this whole image of ice cracking open the tombs of old Starks to fight alongside the dead, but at the same time, fire cracking open the egg of old Targaryens to fight alongside the living. Next clip. Our enemy doesn't tire. Doesn't stop. Doesn't feel. Okay, here we see Danny joining Jon down in the crypts of Winterfell. It sounds like this first episode of season eight will feature a number of parallels and callbacks to the pilot of the series, with Jon and Danny's arrival in Winterfell mirroring Robert's arrival and greeting in Winterfell in the first episode. So I imagine this scene will be a callback to the moment that Ned and Robert visited the grave of Lyanna Stark. Maybe Jon is visiting this grave now after learning from Bran or Sam that this is actually his mother. Though to be clear, I'm not sure if this is her grave, because if you look at that old grave statue behind them, the statues holding its sword by the hilt, as opposed to the statues in the backgrounds of past shots of Lyanna's grave, which held the swords lower on the blade part. But speaking of swords, we see the blacksmiths hard at work in Winterfell, forging new weapons, probably from dragon glass, in order to fight the White Walkers. Leading them is Gendry. Sorry, ladies, it's a bit too cold for him to go shirtless, I guess. We also see Sir Jorah Mormont lining up outside the walls of Winterfell with some Dothraki galloping past behind him. But something interesting to point out about Jorah here, notice what he's armed with. On the left, hanging down from the side of the horse, you can see one weapon. Maybe that's his anointed knight sword, which would be on his right since he's right-handed. But look at the other side. That pommel and cross guard look a lot like Heartsbane, the Valerian Steel family sword of House Tarly, stolen by Sam in season six. Jorah already refused to take back Longclaw, his family Valerian Steel sword given to John by Jorah's father, Gior. So maybe Sam wants this priceless Valerian Steel sword in the most able hands to defend the against the White Walkers. John has Longclaw, Jamie has Widow's Whale, Brienne has Oathkeeper, Arya has the Cat's Paw Dagger. So maybe the next best swordsman would probably be Ser Jorah. We also see a shot of Grey Worm and Masande embracing as he marches off to battle. And then a shot of this figure fighting alongside the fire lit and battlements. It's a bit hard to tell, but notice how the figure cuts through the other, and that other thing begins to disintegrate, much like the way White Walkers disintegrate when you swing Valerian Steel through them. That, plus the haircut of this figure makes me pretty sure this is Brienne. And then right after this, we see Jaime Lannister also partaking in this battle. Now we weren't sure if Jaime was going to make good on his promise to join the others in Winterfell, but I love that his journey has brought him back to the place where he was once such a smug piece of shit. It sounds like he's yelling pull here, like he's commanding archers to release their arrows, or maybe operators of a catapult or trebuchet to release. It's also interesting to see that Jamie and Brienne could be fighting alongside each other in this battle, because in A Storm of Swords, Jamie experienced that whole fever dream while he was sitting on the Weirwood stump, in which he perceives all kinds of strange, potentially prophetic visions, and in one of them, he fought alongside Brienne, with both of them carrying swords of light and flame. Some have theorized that the prophecy of Azor Ahai and the flaming sword Lightbringer could actually be the twin Valyrian steel swords of Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale, which were both forged from the the sword ice, and that these two destined lovers must reunite themselves and their swords to vanquish the White Walkers. Aww, the show probably won't go that deep into mythology, but it's another adorable thing to think about, but let's move on. I promise to fight for the living.
Okay, in this section, we see the Red Keep with Cersei on the Iron Throne, and Kyburn in the mountain, and the Queen's Guard around her. Facing her are two others. One of them could be the Golden Company leader, and the other, perhaps, Tycho Nestoris, Mark Gaddis's character, representative of the Iron Banks, who lent Cersei the money to pay for the Golden Company. But then, next, Cersei appears as some different scene, dressed down, an odd mix of emotions on her face, as she <laughs> sips wine. Now, this should raise some red flags, because remember, Cersei's supposed to be pregnant. At least that's what she told Jaime last season. And drinking isn't supposed to be good for the baby. So, maybe this means she had a miscarriage, which would adhere to that philosophy told to her by the Woods Witch, Maggie the Frog, in the books, that she would bear no more than three children who would die. Or Cersei could have been lying about her pregnancy. Or maybe she is pregnant, she hasn't lost a baby, and it's just one glass of wine. It's also possible that this is a shot of Cersei at the end of her rope, and she's actually swallowing poison. It could be a kind of replay of the moment that she almost poisoned Tommen and herself during the Battle of Blackwater. Next, there's this shot of the two dragons soaring over this beautiful frozen landscape, and this shot of Arya gazing up in shock that we saw in the recent HBO promo. Philip Molina actually did a pretty comprehensive breakdown of these few seconds and what they could mean for Arya's destiny. Make sure to go check out that video. And then after a quick shot of Grey Worm putting on his unsullied helmet, follow this shot of Jon in the God's Wood of Winterfell, we move on. I intend to keep that promise. Okay, here there's a quick shot of the Hound, Sander Clegane, facing away from the flames because remember, he hates fire, fire bad, but considering fire is one of the only ways to kill whites, the Battle of Winterfell is gonna really suck for him. Their Entertainment Weekly article that came out actually included a promo photo of the Hound crossing swords with the mountain, perhaps as a tease for the Clegane Bowl that we've all been dying to happen, or maybe it's just a publicity thing. And Jamie explains his intention to keep his promise to fight for the living, and this location does look like a room in Winterfell, kind of like the room that Daenerys appears to be in later in the trailer. Assuming that Jaime is back in Winterfell, it's just gonna be a very awkward reunion between him and Bran, who probably doesn't need to be the three-eyed raven to remember getting pushed out of a tower. But who knows, maybe Mr. Robot will let bygones be bygones and see a bigger role for Jaime in this war to come and forgive the Kingslayer for his misdeeds. In fact, remember that line from Bran earlier? Everything you did brought you where you are now. Where you belong. Oh. Now, I'm assuming that Bran's probably saying this to Jon Snow, referring to his true identity as Aegon Targaryen and his whole destiny and hero's journey throughout the show. But maybe Bran is actually saying these words to Jaime Lannister, who has also made very surprising choices over the course of this journey and has led him on a very odd and surprising path. And since Jamie has really been a wanderer, maybe his true home is Winterfell. But next, there's a very quick shot of a hand curling around a spear. You can see torch flames flickering. Looks a lot like the lighting of the Red Keep in King's Landing. And actually, that cuff flap over the hand looks a lot like the sleeve of the hand of the Golden Company leader. So this could be him prepping for battle in the Red Keep. But others have said that his hand looks more slender, suggesting this could be someone like Arya. And maybe this leads to her whole water dancing twirls that she does in the other shot. And that Arya could be in King's Landing. If that is true, that finally brings me to the other theory for what Arya could be running from in those opening shots. What if the reason she's no longer wearing her cape is that this setting is a bit warmer and that we're actually seeing her in the middle of an assassin mission in the Red Keep? Remember, at the top of Arya's list is still Cersei. And maybe if Cersei is drinking poison in that one shot, maybe she's being forced to drink the poison by Arya, the way Jaime forced Lady Olena to drink poison when Highgarden fell. It rhymes, just like poetry. And maybe Arya is running from the mountain or other members of the Queen's Guard, or from Euron Greyjoy, from someone in the Golden Company, from a war elephant, probably not. But she's also got that blood on her face. Maybe that blood is someone else's. Maybe it could come from a skin mask that she wore to sneak into the Red Keep. All stuff to think about. But next, there's a shot of Jon charging into battle, probably wondering how many times in his life he's gonna have to get all bloody and muddy outside Winterfell, and some soldiers rushing the gates, and then some quick shots of horses plowing through the snow. If you look real closely at some of these frames, you can almost make out what kind of looks like shaggier white or gray Fur. Maybe among these horses are dire wolves. We haven't seen ghosts in this trailer or like ever. It could also be Nymeria coming back, leading her pack of wolves, rushing into this battle to help. A nerd can dream. Then we see Daenerys and Jon walking up to Drogon and Rhaegal as a feast. You can see the melted ring in the snow from when they charred their 
kill with Dragonfire before eating them. I think we're all hoping that this is leading up to a moment in which Danny mounts Drogon and John mounts Rhaegal, whom remember was named after John's biological father, Rhaegar Targaryen. And there's a quick shot of Sansa doing some dramatic blinking, and then Arya doing some badass moves, twirling a spear, perhaps using some of the moves that she learned from the Waif. But this is interesting. Notice how whatever she kills seems to release a lot of blood. Definitely more blood than you would expect from a white, which is a rotting corpse. One theory that I really like is that we could be looking at giant spiders, or at least giant the size of hounds. Honestly, any spider bigger than a fingernail is giant. Remember, the army of the dead is rumored to have giant spiders. You might remember that terrifying old man ghost story. They swept through cities and kingdoms, riding their dead horses, hunting with their packs of pale spiders, big as hounds. Lady, you're scaring us. Ah! Yeah, Nan's story is even scarier than the real thing. Anyway, maybe all this blood is coming from one of these giant, terrifying spiders. But next, there's a shot of Danny looking pretty bummed out. This is either the face of someone learning they've been boat sexing their nephew, or even worse, that she made a baby with said nephew. And after some quick shots of Tyrion and Drogon blowing fire in our faces, rude, we move on to the last clip. Okay, here the Unsullied are lining up outside Winterfell, again, looking very Helm's Deepy. Behind them, in the darkness, are some kind of wooden machinery, maybe catapults or trebuchets. And joining the ranks are Brienne and Podrick. And notice the soldiers behind them. They're holding shields bearing the white crescent moon and falcon of House Aaron, making these Knights of the Vale. These poor suckers are getting dragged into all kinds of fights they probably don't care about. Now, some have said that if you look at their breastplates, it kind of looks like they're stamped with a new sigil. It's a combination of the Stark Direwolf and the Targaryen dragon. But that could just be from a description of some props that someone saw on set. A little tough for me to make it out here. I don't know why the Knights of the Vale would be wearing so many different sigils. And Sir Joris sizes up the coming threat, an undead centaur. Nah, I don't know, this is probably one of those resurrected horses ridden by one of the White Walker generals, but probably not the Night King, because remember, he would be riding the back of resurrected Viserion. And one more detail, I just love the subtle effect that composer Ramin Djawadi worked into the music, raising the volume and intensity of this reveal. And then when it cuts to black, you can hear a different chord reverberating, creating this kind of disharmonious, offsetting feeling. So all this footage appears to be from the first three episodes of the season. I imagine HBO is going to be pretty cagey about showing anything from the final episode, but already a lot of these characters appear to be in serious mortal danger. So here's my question for you. Which character do you think will be the first to die in the final season of Game of Thrones? Comment down below with your thoughts. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EA Voss. Subscribe to this channel. Check out my monthly live LA comedy show, Darkest Timeline. Thank you for watching, guys. I'm so excited to be back theorizing about Game of Thrones where all the fans are so appreciative and... Patient and nice. Ah, honeymoon's over.